Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Reed. I'm vice chair of the program committee for the League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County. I'd like to state first that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan voter education organization encouraging informed, active participation in government. We believe that voting is a fundamental citizen right that must be guaranteed. While the League does not support candidates or parties, we do take positions on issues we've studied. Our programs do not necessarily represent these positions, but do provide forums to increase understanding of public policy issues for informed action. Another important reminder along the lines of informed action, check out our website for action alerts based on the League's advocacy positions, which are updated regularly. You can find alerts on the website lwvwashtenaw.org under cleverly action alerts in the left-hand column to learn what you can do to be a defender of democracy. There are links for sending messages to your elected representatives and more, and please share these links widely. Inform your friends and neighbors and use them yourself. And now to start tonight's program, we started this election year with a focus on women and power. Last month, we tackled women's control over our own bodies with U of M law professor Leah Littman. Tonight, we explore women, children, and guns with Patrick Carter, who's director of Michigan's, the University of Michigan's Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention. Unregulated access to firearms, which is a reality across much of America, is catastrophic for every American. Every shooting has scores, even hundreds of victims, as frequent and unpredictable exposure to vicarious violence generates fear and anxiety that we often feel helpless to manage. But women and children are uniquely vulnerable because of the role of firearms in intimate partner violence. Abusers with guns are five times more likely to kill their victims. Every month, an average of 57 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. Nearly 6 million women alive today have reported being shot, shot at, or threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. Guns are a key instrument of terror and coercive control of women and children in their own homes. Furthermore, men with domestic violence histories commit the large majority of mass shootings in America. Nearly half of new gun purchases since 2019 have been by women who cite self-defense against a wide range of threats as their primary reason for buying a gun. But statistically, having a gun in your home is more dangerous for you and your family, doubling your risk of becoming a victim of homicide and tripling your risk of suicide, including by children in the home. Tonight, we asked our speaker, what are our options for stemming the tide of gun violence in America and protecting women and children from armed men in their homes. That speaker is Patrick Carter, MD, an associate professor of, of emergency medicine in the School of Medicine and of Health Behavior and Health Education in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. He's the co-director of the University of Michigan Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention and the director of the CDC-funded University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center, and part of the leadership team for the Firearm Safety Among Children and Teens Consortium with the acronym FACTS, which is funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Dr. Carter's research concerns are the development, testing, and implementation of emergency department-based interventions to decrease firearm violence, youth violence, and associated risk behaviors such as substance use among high-risk urban youth. He recently served as chair of the Trauma and Injury Prevention Section of the American College of Emergency Physicians and currently serves as an assistant editor for the Annals of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Carter, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to talk about um, firearm injury prevention and um, I'll highlight a lot of the work and thought that we've um, done around this specifically around um, children and 
uh, women, uh, since that's sort of the topic area of the evening, but um, I'm going to take a broad lens and, and sort of highlight some of the, the specifics that apply to those populations uh, as they go through the talk. Um, and there we go. Okay. So just um, just to outline sort of the, the topics for the evening um, and, you know, obviously open for discussion as, as we wrap up the, um, the, the talk this evening, but I'll talk a little bit about the magnitude of the problem of firearm injury in the United States, how we in, in the scientific community um, think about this problem and think about the solutions to this problem. What do we know that works and what do we know that doesn't work uh, for this problem? And then I'll talk a little bit about what the University of Michigan is doing in this realm, specifically with regards to developing an academic uh, institute focused on addressing this problem and, and thinking about this uh, with a broad lens. And then uh, questions and comments towards the end. So I usually like to start uh, by when I talk about firearm injury by, by starting with what do I mean? So uh, firearm injury is everything um, on the screen. So it's everything from uh, a child who finds an unsecured firearm and injures themselves to uh, youth uh, violence that starts as low level fighting and escalates to lethal violence that involves a firearm. It involves intimate partner violence. It involves adolescent and older adult firearm suicide and it involves uh, police violence. It also involves mass and school shootings. And as you heard in the introduction by Teresa, um, you know, these things apply to broadly across the population. And I'll talk about specifically um, how, they, um, how they affect uh, specific vulnerable populations too. I think it's also important, um, there's probably no more issue other than uh, reproductive health that is as controversial as firearms. And so when I talk about this issue and when we do research and science on this issue, we acknowledge the fact that there's a number of different perspectives about guns and gun ownership and, um, and people's uh, thoughts with respect to uh, policy and respect to the Second Amendment. But uh, my focus and the focus of the academic institute and science that uh, we do on this issue really is about trying to decrease the number of injuries and deaths that occur by firearms. And so we respect and, um, and acknowledge the diverse perspectives that people bring to this issue, but really focus on a common goal that I think everybody can get around, which is the goal of uh, less people dying as a result of firearms. And uh, I think it's important, and as I talk about in, in the work that we do, that these different stakeholders who you see on this screen and all the others that you don't see on this screen are involved in helping to both develop the answers and solutions to this problem, as well as having a voice in their experiences of the problem. So I, I'm an injury prevention researcher and I'm an emergency physician. So I um, take the lens of firearm injuries as a public health disease. And so I talk about it just like I talk about all these other things that have at one time or another um, and still are uh, uh, injury related problems. Um, so we have largely been able to decrease uh, motor vehicle crash injury in this country. And I'll talk a little bit about the parallel between that and, and car, uh, car safety and firearm injury safety. Uh, but we also developed and have science around bicycle helmets to prevent traumatic brain injury uh, with kids who ride bicycles and adults who ride motorcycles. And we've got temperature checks on our water heaters so that uh, we don't see skull burns and we have better car seats and we have decreased uh, smoking in this country uh, through uh, approaching these problems with the science of uh, public health. And so that's the lens through which I bring to this. And uh, I very much agree with David Satcher's quote here uh, from the early to mid nineties when we were actually at a peak of firearm deaths in this country, um, that this is really a health issue because if it's not a health issue, why are people dying from it? And so that's, that's the viewpoint I I'll frame this talk as we go forward. So the problem of firearm injury. So we see about 40,000 deaths in the United States every year due to firearm injuries. About 60% of those are uh, the result of suicide. About 38% are due to homicide and the remainder are uh, a collection of both unintentional injuries or what have traditionally been called accidental injuries and mass shootings. Um, uh, we have seen an increase pretty dramatically over the past couple of years in, uh, in firearm fatalities across the United States. 
about 15% since 2014. And you can see here that in 2017, for the first time in over a generation, um, uh, firearm fatalities actually surpassed motor vehicle crash injury in this country. That's both the reflection of the um, uh, lack of attention to firearm injury and firearm injury prevention, uh, as much as it's a story about the success of our efforts to reduce motor vehicle crash injury in this country. And if you took this same plot that I have here all the way back to the mid 1950s, what you would see is a peak of motor vehicle crash injury in this country that has steadily declined almost 70% over the past half a century. And uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, I can convince you um, that we could do the same with uh, the application of science and injury prevention to the problem of firearm injuries. Uh, I should note that in addition to the increases we've seen in suicide and homicide, uh, we've seen an increase in active shooter incidents or uh, mass shootings over the past decade. That's both an increase in the number of incidents that occur every year, as well as an increase in the number of fatalities that occur per incident. The problem of firearm injury um, doesn't fall evenly across the population. And I'll talk here a little bit about um, the folks who uh, are more vulnerable. Um, the last time I gave this talk, um, which was, or, or talk similar to this, which was probably in the end of tail end of 2020, uh, or 21, sorry. Um, uh, I was telling people that firearm injuries were the second leading cause of death among children and teens. Uh, since the release of the CDC's data in 2020, it is now the leading cause of death for children and teens in the United States. So it has gotten worse. Um, and that's for all kids under the age of, um, of 19. And so a high school age student is more likely to die of a fire injury by the time they graduate high school than any other cause. And as was alluded to in the opening of the talk, uh, when we think about the um, causes of those injuries, when we look at adults, I said that about 60% of those deaths are due to suicide. When you specifically look at the population of kids that are under the age of 19, that ratio flips and about 60% of those deaths are due to homicide. And specifically when you look at homicide deaths under the age of 10, the majority of those are a result of uh, collateral uh, injury due to intimate partner violence in the home. Among our older adult populations, um, suicide is a, a particular uh, problem. And you can see here the uh, steady increase in the red line over the age categories, which is along the x-axis here, uh, showing that as, as the population gets older in the United States, the increase, there's an increase, substantially increased risk for suicide. Another vulnerable population that we see an increase in suicides among our active duty military and veteran populations who have an overall higher uh, suicide rate than the general population, but also are specifically uh, at risk for firearm suicide given access to firearms. In general, um, across all these age categories, um, the risk for males uh, in terms of um, being the victim of firearm injuries is higher but I'm gonna talk about in the next slide specifically uh, where that, um, that risk is different. And that is specifically around the issue of intimate partner violence, intimate partner homicide. So across the lifespan, uh, almost a quarter of all women and about 14% of men in the United States experience severe physical intimate partner violence. So that's uh, hitting, punching, uh, the type of violence that causes a significant injury severe violence behaviors, up to and including firearm-related behaviors. And among all female homicides in the United States, over half of them result from intimate partner violence. And more than half of intimate partner violence homicides are firearm-related. This peaks during the early adult years, so between the ages of 18 and 29. And as uh, Teresa mentioned in the um, opening, uh, a, a lot of mass shooter incidents, the perpetrator is actually um, as part of the mass shooting episode has killed their partner or other family members as part of the incident. Uh, and it's not just uh, fatality as a result of firearms. A one in 27 US women have been threatened with a firearm by a partner and coerced into other behaviors, including um, forced sex and rape. Um, and we see that that doesn't fall evenly across uh, all women in the country either. So pregnant women are at increased risk for intimate partner violence and homicide, underrepresented minority populations, people with disabilities, 
and vulnerable populations such as LB, LGBTQ uh, populations. Looking again at sort of the overall picture of firearm injury, uh, we see that it also there are racial and ethnic disparities. So um, across um, uh, firearm homicides uh, in the United States, they disproportionately impact black youth populations, especially black male youth. Um, who have a homicide rate that's six times higher than other uh, racial and ethnic groups, and suicide rates uh, are higher and disproportionately impact white and Native American, Alaskan Native populations. And this really is an indicator of uh, a number of structural factors that play into um, uh, the risk for firearm injury. And I do highly recommend for folks who have an interest in sort of understanding this topic more than we can get into in this uh, short presentation, this book called The Color of Law really talks about the history of redlining in the United States and the impact that's had among African American communities, especially that's uh, likely a, a huge contributor to the underlying structural issues that uh, perpetuate this uh, disparity in firearm injury outcomes. I think there's a perception often uh, among the general public that firearm injuries only impact certain types of communities. And this slide really highlights the fact that firearm injuries are a problem in all communities. They're a problem in urban settings, they're a problem in uh, suburban settings, they're a problem in rural settings. The underlying intent behind those injuries uh, does change by setting. So we see a higher degree of suicide uh, and, and unintentional injuries among rural settings uh, and a higher uh, degree of homicides among um, uh, urban settings. But really all communities are impacted by this problem highlighting the need to focus across uh, on this problem across all of these types of uh, settings. So you'll see here, I, I highlight non-fatal firearm injury. So all the data I've talked about so far with the exception of the intimate partner violence side really focused on fatal injuries. So um, death as a result of firearms. Um, this slide really tries to capture what we know about non-fatal firearm injuries. And what you're seeing here with all these gaps in the, in the, um, in the um, uh, slide are really the fact that we don't have good quality data in this country around non-fatal firearm injuries. We don't know how many people are showing up to the emergency department with a firearm injury that is not fatal. Um, and that's uh, driven largely by the legacy of an absence of funding for research in this country. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the talk. To our best of our knowledge, the majority of um, of the types of injuries that show up to emergency departments are uh, firearm assaults. And that's largely driven by the fact that um, suicides are so deadly that they largely don't make it to the emergency department. We think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of around 65 to 70,000 uh, non-fatal firearm injuries that are occurring on an annual basis. Although again, um, better data is needed here. So Teresa talked a little bit about this. Uh, in the opening, but um, the, the single biggest risk factor for firearm injury is access to a firearm by a high-risk individual during a high-risk time period. Um, and that can take the form of uh, somebody who is an intimate partner um, uh, perpetrator. It can take the form of somebody who's at a crisis moment uh, around uh, mental health and suicide. And so uh, this risk ends up crossing all of those different types of firearm intents. So you heard in the opening that homicide uh, is three times more likely uh, overall in a home that has uh, access, uh, where there's access to a firearm. And that women specifically are five times more likely to be murdered by an intimate partner uh, when that partner has access to a firearm. Similarly, when we look at uh, school and mass shooting events and suicide attempts, in about 75% of those incidents, the firearm was acquired uh, in school shootings, specifically from the student's home or the home of a relative or family member. And similarly, in suicide uh, completion attempts, uh, the firearm was from the home or the home of a relative. And so we know that that, that access to a firearm, especially by a high-risk individual who may be experiencing distress in the case of suicide or who may have a history of intimate partner violence that at, at prior times was less severe is a risk factor uh, for, uh, for more severe and often fatal injury. So then the question becomes, what does the picture look like with regards to US firearm ownership? So there's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 265 million firearms throughout the United States. 
that represents uh, ownership of by about 22% of US adults. Uh, it's split pretty evenly between handguns and long guns. Uh, but we're, what we're seeing and what's happening in the data over time is that a, a smaller proportion of the population actually owns more guns. So the mean number of firearms that's owned is about 4.9 per owner. Uh, and that represents like 50% of the of firearms are owned by about 14% of the population. But the question doesn't become just around ownership. It also, uh, we wanna look at the um, types of firearms that people are buying and how that's changed over the years. Uh, and what we're seeing is uh, a, a fairly steady increase in the past decade to two decades in terms of the number of firearms that are being uh, produced in the United States, but also uh, specific types of firearms. And that's largely uh, pistols and rifles. And in the next slide, I'll show you that, that, um, that what we're seeing is that a larger caliber uh, firearms are being produced. So um, uh, uh, pistols, um, and rifles that are being produced, but less revolvers and shotguns. So the smaller caliber weapons that cause less damage, uh, we're seeing less of those be produced and more of the type that cause um, a, a larger degree of injury, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and we're seeing mirrored, uh, that's in the sort of production data, but we're also seeing similar findings in the crime trace data that's coming out from uh, guns that are recovered from uh, crime scenes. So what does that all mean in terms of injury and firearm injury? Well, you can see here, this is a plot of uh, by year of injuries, the average injury severity score among uh, individuals who show up to the hospital with a gunshot injury. And injury severity score is a measure or marker of injury, higher is worse. Uh, and what we're seeing is a generally uh, a year over year uh, steady increase in the severity of injuries among those patients who come in and are hospitalized with, uh, with firearm injuries. And that's being largely driven by both increases among younger youth, young adults um, between the ages of 16 to 45, and then older adult firearm injuries. And uh, it reflects both probably an increase in the severity of injury due to this changing calibers of firearms, as I, I just sort of alluded to in the prior slide, and also a little bit of a change in our management in terms of our ability to get EMS more quickly to the scene. And, and some of those people who may have, uh, may have had a fatal injury are making their way to the hospital. So some of that is playing into the data, but largely I think we're seeing increased severity of injury due to these changing uh, patterns and the types of firearms that we're seeing. This is another schematic that represents data from a single um, trauma center that basically shows uh, an increased number of uh, uh, large caliber uh, type of injuries and a decreasing number of smaller caliber type of firearm injuries. Uh, again, sort of highlighting the, um, the findings I was just talking about. So what does this all mean when we think about the cost of this? Uh, there's a human cost, obviously, in terms of the number of fatal injuries that I've, uh, that I've um, mentioned, as well as uh, non-fatal injuries. Um, there's also a financial cost, an economic cost to the US economy. And that, so that's been quantified by researchers to be about $229 billion annually. That data is actually a little old at this point, so it's probably higher than that. But when you look at that in comparison to other medical issues and other um, costs, you see that the cost of obesity in this country is around 224 uh, billion, so roughly on par with that. Uh, and the, uh, the whole Medicaid system spends around $291 billion a year. So it falls right in the middle of those two things. When we look at those costs, about 8.6 billion is direct cost. That means the cost of treating medical injuries due to uh, firearms. And the remainder is, is uh, sort of falls into the bucket of indirect costs. So the cost of providing long-term medical care to somebody who has a spinal cord injury as a result of a firearm, uh, or the cost of court proceedings and criminal justice proceedings, um, and uh, lost quality of life uh, due to uh, people who expire as a result of a uh, firearm injury. So a pretty costly problem. So now I'll turn a little bit to how we think about um, in terms of injury and science, how we think about uh, reducing uh, this problem overall. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of the framework and the approach that we take. Uh, 
And that's really what we call the public health approach. And so you can see here on the left that the public health approach really focuses on what's the problem. And I've already sort of outlined a lot of that for you in terms of the, the uh, epidemiology of the problem. And then how do we think about what are those risks and protective factors that are key to uh, key to uh, this the, the outcomes that we wanna try and prevent? And then how do we develop and test prevention strategies uh, when we find that they work, how do we implement them broadly across uh, society? And then how do we evaluate their effectiveness over time? And that's really the sort of simple model for how we think about these types of problems. And the other way to think about that is using data around what works and what doesn't work to drive uh, knowledge and action in this space. I think it's important as we think about this problem to highlight that there are things that we can do uh, at all different levels, um, we can do these things one-on-one -on -one with patients in the exam room, which is a lot of the kind of stuff that I do uh, as a physician. Uh, that's what we call the individual level. We can do uh, interventions that really focus on interactions between people, so family-based interventions or uh, mentoring programs or um, uh, programs that really focus on developing uh, social skills. We can do things at the community level that, that really try and change some of those structural factors I talked about earlier that underlie a lot of the racial and ethnic disparities. And then we can do things at the policy level. Uh, and all of, these, um, all of these are valid different levels to approach and tackle the problem. And they're one part of a, a giant puzzle to solving this problem. And uh, the data is clear um, that when we want to achieve the biggest uh, change in a, in a public health issue like firearm injury, that we really have to focus across all of these different levels of, of what we call the socioecological spectrum. So looking at ways of, of doing things across all of these different uh, aspects. And I think uh, what's illustrative is to think about this problem of uh, vehicle crash injury prevention because I think it's a nice model for how to approach a problem like firearm injuries. And, and uh, you can see here in the picture, uh, a, a, cra a car crash from the 1950s. And you wouldn't see this car crash today because this pole would never be placed that close to a roadway in the United States, uh, because we've changed that in terms of uh, a structural factor, an engineering factor for how to make uh, roadways safer. And cars this way, uh, because we've built safer cars with airbags and uh, better, um, better front crumple zones and collapsible steering columns to prevent injury. Uh, and so um, uh, we've taken this holistic approach to uh, addressing the issue of firearm, uh, motor vehicle crash injury in this country. Um, and the types of solutions that we have been able to develop as a, as a component of that really are a success story. And here you can see the 70% decline in motor vehicle crash deaths that we've had across the, uh, across the last half a century in the United States. And I highlight here some of just the examples because I think it highlights the breadth of the focus on this problem from all those different levels I just talked about. So uh, interventions around how to avoid crashes. And this is, and you can see some examples here of, of better, um, better systems in our cars uh, as well as making cars more crashworthy, meaning that they can sustain a crash injury, seatbelts and airbags and crumple zones, um, behavioral modifications around the way people drive. It used to be in the 1950s, you would have a drink before you get in your car and drove home. Now that type of behavior would not be considered to be acceptable uh, uh, to have one more before the road. And that's largely driven through behavioral modifications in how we drive and also policy level interventions around uh, limits to blood alcohol content and minimum drinking age laws and zero tolerance laws for underage drinking. We've made roadways safer. We've improved our trauma system so that we get to crashes quicker. And we've really focused on some of the vulnerable populations, including children uh, who are at high risk for uh, car crashes, both when they're young in terms of building better car seats, as well as when they begin to drive and how do we, how do we train and, uh, and license drivers. Uh, similarly, elderly uh, populations who may not be able to safely drive anymore and how do we assess that and how do we uh, do interventions to prevent injury among that population specifically.
Uh, this is a video um, that I think is helpful to show sort of the differences. Um, this was put out by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. I'm going to try and play it. I don't know if the sound will play, but the video um, is, uh, is, um, is really the, the key finding here. And what you can see here is two cars, one from the 1950s and one from the uh, current day, and you can see just the level of damage and difference between the two vehicles, between uh, the 1959 Chevy Corvair and the 2009 Chevy Malibu, and you can just see the difference in um, in the destruction to the vehicles. And the other thing I like to remind people about when they see this video is I hear a lot when we talk about firearm injuries that we can't do anything because of all the different advocacy groups on different sides that. Um, that don't want us to address this problem uh, through this public health lens. But I remind people that in the early 1950s, car companies didn't want to make any changes in terms of safety either. And now in 2009, car companies are marketing around safety and selling their cars to the American public around safety. And so that type of sea change uh, can certainly be possible around the issue of firearms. Just a little bit more in terms of how we think about this problem. And uh, we largely have uh, William Hayden to think about that for something called the Hayden Matrix. Um, he's considered the father of injury epidemiology and he was the first head of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, and he developed something called the Hayden Matrix, which really thinks about the problem of car crashes from what are the things that are occurring before the crash happens, at the time of the crash and after the crash and then takes the lens of what are the issues that are happening with the driver as well as the vehicle and the environment that surrounds the vehicle in terms of both the physical environment and the social environment. And uh, using this matrix model to, the, to think about all of these different realms that are uh, part of the crash, we can then think about all the different interventions we can do at all these different levels to mitigate the risk for motor vehicle crash. And we can do the same thing with um, with fire injury. And you can see here an example of a Hayden matrix that was developed around school shootings and thinking about what are the factors in terms of the student who comes to school that day, the firearm and how they got access to it, the uh, victims of the event, the social physical environment that surrounds the kid. What about bullying beforehand? What about um, a breakup with a girlfriend or a boyfriend beforehand that led to the incident? And then what are the outcomes of that incident? And then we can start to think about in the same way how we apply these types of solutions at all these different levels, both from uh, of the level of how we make we decrease the access to the firearm at the home, how we address bullying upstream of this event, or how we address uh, issues around dating violence or youth violence or peer violence that led to the uh, physical environment. How do we have anonymous reporting systems so that when another kid is told that something's going to happen, they can they can tell a parent or teacher without fear of reprisal and, uh, and alert uh, staff to that event and prevent it from happening in the first place. And so that's just an example of how we can apply these types of things to this problem. I'm gonna switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about some of what we do know works and, um, and that we've either tested or we are um, testing currently um, as part of our sort of uh, look at trying to apply the Hayden matrix broadly across this problem. And I said up front um, that firearm access by individuals who are at high risk or at high risk times is the single greatest risk factor for uh, injury. So decreasing access to those firearms is the mitigating factor. And so one of the key uh, areas we talk about here is storing firearms safely. Uh, and by that, I mean locking uh, firearms up and, and preventing access by individuals who shouldn't have access at high risk times. And so when we talk about locked storage, we mean in an ideal situation, a gun safe or a locked box where the firearm is stored unloaded and the safety switch is engaged and the ammunition is stored in a locked box separately. There are other options for storage, and that includes, you can see here in the pictures, a trigger lock and a firearm cable lock. Those I would consider to be a little bit less safe just because they require an individual to actually manipulate the trigger of the firearm and increase the risk for the firearm to discharge. Um, 
I think it's important that when we think about firearm storage, we're thinking about firearm storage broadly. So most people think about it within the context of their own personal gun and storage of a firearm in the, in the home. But uh, we often also think about, again, thinking about that Hayden matrix model or that public health approach, we think about it within the context of how does somebody gain access to a firearm that may not be in their property. And I told you already that 75% of um, uh, individuals who uh, have completed suicide and 75% of uh, school shooting incidents, the firearm is from the home of an adolescent or a close relative or family member. And so I think it's important to consider uh, sources for uh, firearm access that aren't necessarily your own home, but homes where your children, teens, uh, may go to spend time, uh, friends, relatives, grandparents, and whether there's a firearm there and whether they could gain access to it. And in a recent survey that we did as part of the Institute, we found that 25% of high school age teens report that they had identified and knew of an off property, meaning not their own home source to gain uh, access to a firearm. And so that's a quarter of all kids. And so think about um, that playing into access to a firearm and a potential event. And so important um, as, uh, as parents that we think about, you know, is there a gun where my children and my teens are going to spend time and talking to, um, to other parents uh, in the neighborhood around whether or not there, there is access to a firearm in that home. And we know that providing counseling around safe storage works. And so this is from data from individual level interventions that have been done in healthcare settings that clearly show that the majority of families are receptive to physicians and healthcare providers talking about the risks of firearms during healthcare visits and about storage. And we know that it um, can work to improve safer um, storage practices after they receive counseling. And uh, it has to be done in a framework that uh, respects uh, the values of firearm ownership, but, um, but has been shown uh, to be effective. And so um, is, a, is a promising uh, intervention uh, to uh, have and train physicians around doing more of. And I do think it's important to provide uh, clinicians and allied health professionals with these skills. And I think one of the reasons physicians and healthcare professionals, and we've asked this in surveys, don't do enough counseling around how to store and uh, lock firearms safely with their patients is they don't know enough about firearms in order to do it. So there's a technical um, uh, aspect to, um, to counseling that requires them to gain knowledge around how firearms operate and how they're stored. In the same way, if they were to counsel uh, around uh, having the, uh, their, uh, their patients uh, wear a bicycle helmet or use a car seat safely, they would need to know how those things operate. They need to understand how uh, firearms uh, operate in order to talk to families around how to store them safely. And so we have developed at childfiremsafety.org a series of videos that really focus on both the technical aspects of how you store a firearm safely, as well as uh, how you provide counseling uh, around uh, this issue to patients. And so it's, uh, it's geared mostly towards clinicians, but I mention it here because I think it's still um, a, good, uh, a good set of videos to, for people to learn a little bit more if they're interested in kind of understanding the, the parts of a firearm and how they can be stored safely. Uh, and so I bring it up uh, uh, as an opportunity for education. I also talked a little bit about um, decreasing access for uh, folks who are at risk for suicide. And this is really what we term lethal means access. And so uh, the, the theory behind this is, um, is that most, and the data shows this, most suicidal crises are very short lived. And the method that somebody uh, attempts suicide with depends heavily on the availability at the time that they're experiencing their crisis. And we know that um, the rate, risk of fatality varies quite substantially by the method of suicide attempt. Firearms are 90% fatal if they're used in a suicide attempt. Whereas when somebody takes pills or other uh, means of suicide, the, the fatality rate is around 1%. And so uh, if we can get people through that brief period of crisis without accessing this lethal object of a firearm, we can hopefully get them to the help they need or even if they do end up attempting a, another type of uh, suicide, it's usually one that's less lethal and provides the medical community more time to, uh, to get to them and to, and to hopefully decrease a, a potentially lethal outcome. Uh, and so uh, the idea is to 
store these firearms in a safer way uh, that are locked in order to prevent access at that high risk time, especially when um, when folks are experiencing uh, distress, depression, uh, and uh, and crises that are going on. I also like to emphasize that um, there's sort of an optimal way to store firearms, uh, which really is what I talked about before with the gun safe and uh, and storing them unloaded. But that's not the only means of reducing risk at high risk times. So uh, we know that uh, for some families, uh, having firearms are a really important part of their cultural values. And so uh, how do we reduce risk for teens in the home or children in the home? We can think about ways of providing only supervised access to firearms, or if they're experiencing uh, a really crisis moment, removing the firearm temporarily from the home. And there are a number of gun ranges and shops that are increasingly allowing people to store firearms in, uh, in the gun shop and uh, range uh, in order for them not to be stored at home where they might be accessed by a teen or a child uh, who's at high risk for self-harm. One of the um, other areas that I think is a real active area of um, work currently is the idea of engineering solutions. So can we build a safer firearm? I talked a little bit earlier about building safer cars and uh, ones that can sustain um, uh, and help prevent injury. Um, we can uh, potentially do the same thing with guns. And so this is the idea of smart gun technology where either you know, there's a loaded chamber indicator is one, one option where it identifies whether or not there's a bullet in the chamber so that it's not fired ac accidentally or higher pressure triggers that don't allow a young uh, child to be able to fire it or biometric uh, fingerprint signature firearms that only allow the person who owns the firearm to be able to fire it. There's similar technology with RFID rings. Um, there's also the idea of smart firearm storage devices that you don't necessarily need to make the firearm uh, as safer, but you can make the storage device that it's in safer. One of the things we hear most commonly from families is the reason they leave the firearm out is because they want to have access to it if they need to defend themselves. But if it's stored in a safe firearm uh, or smart firearm storage device, they would still have a rapid access to the firearm, but it would be stored safely so that a child or a teen can't gain access to it. Uh, there's also technological or engineering solutions that are really focused on addressing illegal firearm behaviors. So this is the idea of micro stamping uh, by the firearm uh, on a bullet if it's used in a crime that enhances the ability of law enforcement to trace and track criminal activity. Well, these are potential options um, for um, for uh, reducing firearm injury. There is some controversy around them. So uh, similar to when um, uh, seatbelt interlocks or alcohol interlocks were introduced into vehicles, there's, um, there is a failure rate with all kinds of technology. And so uh, the goal of this type of solution is really that we have to decrease the, uh, the failure rate to something that's acceptable among firearm owners so that they can gain access at high risk times when they want to, but also so that it provides the safety that we need. And, and so that it's not fired inadvertently because somebody thinks the the firearm is safer than it actually is. Um, the other problem, as I sort of already mentioned earlier, is while these engineering solutions might hold promise, there are 350 million guns out in circulation currently. And unless this technology can be widely deployed, it's likely to not have an immediate impact on reducing firearm injuries. So there's promising technology here, but exactly how it is deployed or needs to be deployed um, is, uh, is really an active area of research. Turning a little bit to think about interpersonal violence prevention. And when I talk about this, I'm thinking about both uh, non-partner violence, um, what was traditionally been called peer violence among teens and youth, as well as partner-focused uh, uh, violence. There's a lot of work going on in uh, healthcare settings around what can we do to reduce um, to reduce youth who are involved in violence. And we know that there's a trajectory that happens over time where youth might start with engagement and involvement in more peer related violence behaviors, but that often transitions as they get into an adult period of time when they're engaged more in relationships into partner violence. So there's this trajectory that happens over time. And so how do we prevent that early on upstream uh, to, to decrease 
negative health outcomes uh, that relate to both uh, partner and peer violence. So some of that is around identifying risk. So when we think about who's at high risk for future firearm violence involvement, our team has developed a, a screening tool called the safety score, which really focuses on identifying youth uh, who come into healthcare settings who may be at high risk to be involved over time in, uh, in uh, firearm violence. And this is a screening tool that could be used in, in healthcare settings. Uh, you'll notice one of the things that it doesn't ask is, uh, did you perpetrate a firearm injury? It asks more about other behaviors and uh, fighting behaviors, friends that carry uh, firearms or weapons, um, the type of neighborhood that they might live in that might be a sign of structural factors, and then uh, potential for victimization. And the reason for that is that creates a safer screening tool that doesn't uh, force them to disclose a negative behavior that they themselves are engaged in, but still identifies their risk for future behaviors around that. And so we're working on testing out this model as well as developing additional screening tools that can be used across a range of firearm outcomes, including um, uh, intimate partner violence related uh, firearm outcomes. And so uh, that research is ongoing and there's, there's more work to be done there, but, um, but I highlight one example of that. We also developed and tested an uh, intervention called Safer Teens. Safer Teens is a brief 30-minute uh, motivational interviewing therapist-delivered counseling session that we've done in healthcare settings. And now at this point, it originated in emergency department settings, but is expanded to include primary care settings. And we're actually testing this uh, type of intervention in behavioral health settings. And uh, the, um, the gist of it is the intervention focuses around um, helping youth and young adults identify positive life goals and positive values and, uh, and helping them to recognize that, that fighting behaviors and violence, including partner and uh, non-partner violence behaviors won't allow them to sort of get to their goals and have potential consequences. And then helps to teach them a set of skills around how to navigate and decrease their own violence involvement. So these are things like nonviolent conflict resolution, positive communication, decreasing risk factors around alcohol and drug use, decreasing risk factors around weapon carriage, including firearm carriage, um, that help to decrease these outcomes. And what we've shown is that even this brief 30-minute intervention done one-on-one -on -one between a social worker and uh, a patient in a clinical setting can decrease violence involvement for out to a year. And it was originally designed as an intervention focused on peer violence. However, uh, we also found that it affected and impacted intimate partner violence uh, in addition to peer violence. Uh, there's more work going on here that's expanding uh, on this original Safer Teens intervention and now focusing uh, uh, specifically on firearm behaviors. And there's a project that we're doing called Project Interact that's focused really on uh, decreasing firearm behaviors among youth, uh, as well as looking at how do we prevent uh, violence and retaliatory violence and future violence among individuals who come in with a violent injury in the emergency department. And that's another ongoing research project that we're doing currently. I mentioned that um, this work is uh, a lot of what I've talked about is really at the individual level when I talk about safe storage and I talk about um, uh, safer teens and those types of interventions. Um, we've done work that's looked at multiple levels of interventions, um, including addressing issues around mentoring between fathers and sons and targeted outreach mentoring of vulnerable youth, uh, as well as um, interventions around community policing and cleaning, cleaning green initiatives, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but these multi-level interventions that really address all of these common factors um, uh, have the potential to be the most powerful because they address all these aspects of the problem uh, and can and have been shown uh, in, our, in our data very clearly to decrease outcomes among the individuals who are receiving the intervention and the communities that surround them. I'll talk for just a quick minute here. One of the things that I think has gotten a fair amount of press um, and uh, that is a, a community level intervention is really taking vacant lots and uh, doing community greening uh, around them. And this work here, you can see these pictures here are actually from Philadelphia. And uh, what's been shown is that by improving the green spaces in neighborhoods, um, you decrease uh, from the picture that looks at the left, the sort of broken windows theory where one broken window leads to sort of a downward spiral in a community, 
to this other uh, picture here on the right, which is really one where things are cleaned up. It's a safe space. People can go out in the neighborhood and have positive, healthy social interactions. And what's been shown is that even just the simple cleaning of uh, neighborhood vacant lots decreases firearm uh, interpersonal violence, it decreases vandalism, and it increases the health and uh, safety of the uh, people in the neighborhood. And, and we're working on a number of um, uh, research work right now that looks at sort of how best to deploy these types of interventions in communities uh, that engage youth and involve uh, uh, residents of the community. And so there's more work here to be done, but, but this is a really promising approach to solving the problem of uh, firearm violence. And I'll shift gears for a minute and talk just about sort of public policy approaches to this. And I think this is where people mostly when they think about uh, how do we solve the problem of fire and violence, their thoughts go immediately to policy. And part of the reason I don't start there is because there's all these other things that we can do upstream of that. And um, policy is an important component, but not the only component to solving this problem. And I talked a little bit about the Hayden matrix being important to focus on all those different boxes and, and parts of the problem. Uh, in terms of policy, really the focus um, for most of the past few years has been around how do we prevent high risk people from obtaining firearms at high risk times? And I told you that firearm access at those times by those types of people are really um, uh, the key risk factor um, for a lot of these firearm outcomes. So you've heard a lot about probably comprehensive background checks, and we know that states that have strict, stricter background checks in place and enforcement of those checks see a, a substantial reduction in injury, including a 40% lower risk of intimate partner violence just by having background checks uh, in an, and having them enforced. And we also see a decreased risk of law enforcement being killed in those states. So comprehensive background checks and expanding those background checks and enforcing those background checks clearly has an impact on preventing high-risk people from getting access to a firearm at a time they shouldn't. And we've seen the reverse happen too, where states that weaken their background check laws end up experiencing an increase in the risk of subsequent violent crime. You've probably also heard a lot about uh, domestic violence restraining orders as well as extreme risk protection orders. And there are some um, subtle nuances here. Uh, so domestic violence restraining orders are a broader tool that can be used at the policy level where uh, families and households can petition for placement of a domestic violence restraining order against uh, a perpetrator of intimate partner violence, typically when there's been a prior incident. And it allows for an enforcement of broader protections around no contact, it enforces counseling, and it often involves a component around firearm access. And we know that when domestic violence restraining orders are in place and firearm access is a component of them, that we see a 25% reduction in the risk of intimate partner violence homicide. ERPOs, which are a newer tool, are extreme risk protection orders. They're often called red flag laws. Uh, ERPOs are um, really a new tool that allow either family or law enforcement to petition a court to, um, to decrease the access to a firearm when somebody is a risk for either harm to themselves or harm to somebody else. So they're a little bit more narrow tool uh, and they have a broader focus though, not just on intimate partner violence, but also on suicide prevention. The evidence base for how ERPOs are being used and how and whether they're effective is still being developed. And that's a real active area of research. Um, you'll probably also have heard a little bit about focused deterrence. It's often called hotspot policing, where uh, you can direct police resources to specific spots to decrease um, uh, firearm um, uh, violence and, uh, um, and interpersonal violence in neighborhoods. Uh, and that can be effective. It's often had a poor implementation. So it's been differentially implemented and you'll have heard about probably stop and frisk laws and the application of stop and frisk disproportionately impacting uh, um, underrepresented minority populations. And so uh, while there is some impact to uh, applying these hotspot policing methods, there have been unintended consequences of the way they have been implemented and applied uh, in communities that have led to um, significant disparities in outcomes and disparities in the way they're applied. So um, they've largely been pulled back from being in use because of that, because they're not uh, rolled out in the way that uh, is most effective and, uh, and is um, 
uh, and and um, they're not implemented sort of by the uh, the by the standard that was set for the original research. Um, another key area of focus is in looking at preventing uh, illegal firearm diversion. So uh, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms um, groups have um, found that you know largely it's un unlicensed sellers of firearms straw purchasers and a small portion of licensed dealers that really account for the largest portion of diversion of firearms from the legal market, that's legal lawful ownership of a firearm to the illegal market by carriage or use of a firearm that, that is um, illegally acquired and then often ends up in used in violent crimes. And so really the legal firearm dealers represent the smallest portion of that. And so thinking about ways that policies can be implemented to decrease that diversion from the legal market to the illegal market is another key way to think about how we prevent people who shouldn't have firearms at high risk times from gaining access to firearms. And there's been a lot of discussion around thinking about higher standards for legal firearm ownership, but we haven't seen a lot of policies out in, uh, in practice around that. Uh, I'll wrap up here by just talking a little bit about the new institute at the University of Michigan um, and the work that we're doing um, uh, around firearm injury prevention. You've heard a, a little bit of a smattering of that along the way as I've talked about it, but I thought I would give a, a little bit of an overview of how the University of Michigan is thinking about this issue. Um, you heard me talk a lot in the talk about the fact that um, there's more research to be done and we haven't had the same gains in reducing fire injury that we've had in motor vehicle crash uh, prevention. And that's largely as a result of the decrease in firearm research that's gone on in this country over the past 20 years as, as a result of the Dickey Amendment um, in the early 90s. And you'll see here the schematic at the left shows, um, shows funding for major health issues in accordance with the uh, with the fundings on the y-axis and the mortality rates on the x-axis. And you can see most things fall along this line somewhere. You can see that firearm violence falls very far off the curve in that it causes high mortality but receives little funding. And this is from uh, 2017. And so that lack of research funding to figure out and develop and identify what the solutions are uh, has had a significant impact on the ability of us in the scientific community to help develop those, uh, those solutions to the problem. Uh, and you can see here, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to think about that. One is mortality, uh, but you know, in the scientific community, we often think about publications as being some measure of knowledge around a topic area. And what we can see is that that decreased funding and impact of um, of uh, the Dickey Amendment was uh, a decrease in this, a significant decrease in scientific output uh, from, um, from the scientific community around solutions to this problem and research on this problem and figuring out all those components of the public health cycle that I talked about. And one of the other legacies of that is less people in the field, um, less senior researchers, less institutional knowledge. Uh, around this problem and no pipeline for developing new trainees and new researchers in the field to develop new solutions and new thought around this issue because there was no funding for them to do research so they couldn't attract people to the field. We've really seen a shift in that over the past couple of years, largely um, as a result of the 2012 Newtown shooting and the federal government has really made a shift in, in starting to fund through the NIH and the NIJ and the CDC work in this area. And the University of Michigan has really been a key driver of a lot of that research. And uh, you heard Teresa talk a little bit about in the intro, the FACTS Consortium, which is one of the first NIH funded grants that focused on reducing firearm injuries among children and teens and really building capacity for the field to do that research. And so the University of Michigan has stepped into this space and tried to think about how they could bring together faculty from across campus to focus on this problem and to develop new research and new uh, and develop that pipeline of trainees that's been lagging for so long uh, uh, for to address this problem and develop this idea of an institute that's focused on this problem and that launched in June of this year. And the comparison is really to 
all the institutes that are on campuses around the country in motor vehicle crash injury prevention. And you can see here a schematic that shows all of the institutes and academic institutions that focus on transportation safety or motor vehicle crash, including here at the University of Michigan, where we have an entire building of researchers focused on that, on motor vehicle crash prevention. And we've built a automated vehicle city to look at how automated vehicles work. Think about what could happen if we applied that same kind of uh, attention and focus and research and dollars to the problem of firearm injuries uh, across the across the spectrum. And uh, so this is our mission statement to really engage the breadth of expertise across the university and focus on challenge and solutions to this problem. We're organized across a number of different cores that involve research and training and uh, engagement with community partners. And then we're really focused across a number of different areas. So everything from suicide and community violence to intimate partner violence and unintentional uh, accidental injuries and lethal police violence. And then we really have an important uh, focus on uh, involving stakeholders in the process. And I said that sort of upfront with that schematic around involving stakeholders. I think it's a key part of how we solve this problem. You can't solve the problem without firearm owners and uh, their perspectives and their knowledge and their involvement. And so I think it's really important to involve them in this, in this process of research uh, to develop solutions. I'll stop here uh, and just say, um, uh, this is a lot of the areas where we work across the state here in Michigan. And so I highlight that at the left and we're uh, actively working on training new researchers in this space and doing new research in this space and expanding the science of fire injury prevention. And with that, I will stop. So interesting. Thank you. My gosh, that time just absolutely flew. Um, we have several questions. A couple came in early, and, uh, and then we have at least one in the chat. Um, I wanted to just ask you real quick off the top to clarify, you referred a few times to the Dickey Amendment. And, um, you know, we can see what the impact was in the in crushing research. But could you just explain uh, thumbnail what the Dickey Amendment was? Sure. Um, a lot of the um, data that you presented at the top um, was from some researchers in the early 1990s that looked at the risk of firearm ownership and um, on outcomes around suicide and homicide and intimate partner violence mm -hmm. and demonstrated sort of an increased risk with firearm ownership. And it wasn't in, in a way to say that folks shouldn't own firearms. It was just presenting the data as it stood. And as a result of that, um, there was this real move among a number of uh, congressional leaders to limit the ability of the federal government to, um, to fund research. And that culminated in this thing called the Dickey Amendment, which basically um, prohibited the CDC from funding any research that sort of advocated a position around, uh, around firearms and firearm ownership. And while none of that research really did that, um, the effect of the Dickey Amendment being in place was that it really decreased the willingness of federal funders to fund research in this area. And so you saw initially a, a pretty steep decline in um, uh, a steep decline in uh, in funding of firearm research from the CDC, and then the NIH and NIJ largely followed after that. And so that was sort of the the uh, initial spin away and, you know, as I said, sort of spun back with uh, Newtown. Yeah, your um, your account of, of the impact of that is really devastating and thorough, just mm -hmm. incredible. So um, I forget what I was going to ask you, but here's another question right off the top. And this came in earlier. Um, so specific problems and strategies that arise around guns in, in rural areas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I sort of said at the um, at the beginning, um, you know, uh, suicide especially is a particular problem uh, among um, uh, rural adults and especially older adults. Mm -hmm. And so, thinking about how, uh, especially as adults get older, you know, what's the safest way to store a firearm? When can an adult not have control of a firearm anymore? Um, because they're developing dementia and they're at risk for harming themselves or harming somebody else with a firearm. Or you're starting to see that um, as folks get older, they may be experiencing uh, depression and suicidality and isolation. And, and so when, when do family need to step in and think about like, is it time not to, not to, um, not to have um, 
you know, uh, an older adult own uh, a firearm or how can we make it safer for them to own it? And, uh, and I talked a little bit about there's lots of options there. So we can store it safely. We can store it off site. We can allow for supervised access. We can, um, we can remove the firing pin if it's important to have the firearm in the home, but don't want it to be active and to be a, a, an active tool. Um, those are just some of the measures that can be taken. But what we don't know is when is that time or when is that shift? And there's a whole field of research right now looking at sort of how do you evaluate that? Similar to how do we evaluate an older adult driver and are they still capable of driving? Um, and so oftentimes you have the challenge of multiple firearms and, and um, and both firearms that are initially sort of used for hunting and, and those kind of things, as well as handguns. And so how do you how do you address all of those factors? And I, that's still an area that we're, we're working on. But safe storage is a clear issue, uh, as well as sort of evaluating older adults. You know, it's um, Andrew Yang had an op ed in the Washington Post, I think this this week sometime titled The Boys Are Not All Right. And he went and he presented a lot of data about, um, about what men and boys are suffering in America right now. Um, it, it, you know, he said he wrote that uh, men and boys across all regions and ethnic groups have been failing both absolutely and relatively for years. And he references um, you know, ADHD, that boys are more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, five times more likely to spend time in juvenile de detention, less likely to finish high school. I was shocked to read that men are only 40.5% of college students now. I, I had no idea. And that males are dropping out of community college um, a, a, a at twice the rate um, that girls are. So, uh, and then of course, with the decline of manufacturing jobs, um, a lot of males, uh, of course, not just men, you know, our identities are very much wrapped up in what we do. And a lot of males are, um, especially rural and older males are, aff are afflicted with despair. And um, these deaths of despair from alcohol and drugs and firearms, um, he mentioned and that just it's a little it's different than the urban problems right and it feels to me like it might be harder to address because the causes are so deep and diffuse i i don't know that it's different in as many ways as we sometimes think it is um i i think that you know economic despair is certainly not isolated to rural communities it's also in urban communities i think a lot of the structural factors that underlie that um, and that have been sort of exacerbated by, you know, 25 years of, of economic changes um, mm -hmm. uh, in this country are, are really um, at the root of that. I think what differs is a lot of the sort of um, structural racism and, um, and disparities factors that play into some of the more urban context, but but they play into the rural context in a different way. And so I think, you know, still thinking about, um, um, you know, there's commonalities across all of those communities in terms of um, both the economic impact, the role of poverty, the role of substance use, the role of untreated mental health issues. Um, right. All of those things are factors that, um, you know, again, sort of in the setting of access to a firearm, you know, can can lead to devastating outcomes and consequences. Yeah, I, I was really your socio ecological spectrum um, is a very helpful. It's it's it it's like the problem can feel kind of overwhelming, and that's a really good graphic for understanding that. Um, of course, there are possible interventions at all of those um, at all those levels of engagement, and that you're researching them <laughs> that's really good and yeah, i mean there's... personally there's people across the spectrum doing it but yes absolutely yeah. and i think it's nice to to break it down in that way and the hayden matrix i think does that too because i think it sort of says look this is a really complex problem with all kinds of contributing factors but this is one aspect we can address here and this is one aspect we can address here and there's different people focused on all these different parts of the problem and and then the totality of that, once we figure out what works, is what can move the needle, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting. It's it's exciting that so much is is being done, and that you do have these tools for conceptualizing where do we need to where do we need to attack this problem. Um, I'm thinking about a couple of individual solutions um, solutions at the individual level. One quickly: um, Are most gun owners receptive to the idea of safe gun technology? So I would say no, um, not yeah. in its current form. Uh -huh. um, I, I think the most recent data I've seen on that, I think there's a lot of resistance to it, um, largely for some of the factors I talked about, which is, you know, part of the, you know, the most overwhelming reason people say they own, they want to own handguns, especially is for protection, and they right. want to have access to those firearms in the moment when they feel like they need them, although they may not necessarily live in communities where there's a high risk of violence, they still feel they need the, the handgun for protection. And so um, um, the problem with the current safe gun technology as it's sort of um, conceptualized is that there is a failure rate and there is the potential that it won't be able to be accessed in the moment and be able to be used in the moment the way that they expect it to. And so the acceptability yeah. around that I think is, is problematic, but we've faced some of those same challenges, as I said, sort of in the motor vehicle crash realm in terms of some of the safety interventions that have been put into cars. And it takes years and it takes figuring out what will be acceptable and it takes modifying the technology and the interventions in order to make the product acceptable. And, and I said, you know, in the 1950s, car companies were resistant to any kind of safety device and now they market on yeah. safety devices. And so, yeah. so that, isn't a, that isn't a far fetched idea that there'll be a shift in that in 50 years. It just may take 50 years to get there. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, when I think about the, um, the thumbprint or fingerprint access, right? Um, which seems brilliant. And then I think about how often it fails on my phone. Right. <laughs> you know? Like I have to punch in the darn number. And if I'm in a panic, it's going to be harder to do that. So I can see. So for so for gun owners who have their guns for sport, for target shooting and hunting and so forth, I feel like that's probably, there's probably greater receptivity to some of the, to the safe gun technology. But well, for I'm people here. who have the guns for safety, perceived safety, less so. There, there may be greater receptivity, but there's also probably less likelihood for them to need to have access to it in the moment. So there's probably more right. receptivity I mean. to, well, there's probably more receptivity to other mechanisms of storage, such as mm -hmm. a gun safe or a locked storage safe, where they don't, because they're not, that gun is not one they need to access in the moment. It's this mm -hmm. handgun over here that they need to access in the moment. So, so I think some of it plays into the type of gun um, too. Right. Not all populations are monolithic either. So, you know, this differs by population. And, and, um, and so we have to think about how the solution applies across different reasons for gun ownership and different types of populations. Yeah. Um, complex, a wicked problem. Um, so um, you, one of your slides was so interesting, um, the 30 minute safer teens intervention. I know I, I noticed a question in chat from Rena about another kind of intervention, which we'll get to, but the safer teens intervention, can you talk for just a minute about what, what's in those 30 minutes for one thing? And then also on the slide, it looked like the control group dropped precipitously as well. So can you talk about that just briefly? And then we'll get to Rena's question. Sure. Um, so um, I'll come back to the control group question. So the intervention itself is a 30 minute um, a counseling session. Um, the session starts by talking to a teen, essentially, who's been involved in fighting uh, about, um, about sort of what their values are, what their goals are in life, you know, a very positive conversation. It's really focused on resilience and, and positivity and, and where they want to go and what they want to achieve. And then, uh, and then really starts to talk to them about their experiences with fighting and violence uh, behaviors in the past and potential or experience consequences of those behaviors. And the idea there is to really start to build a discrepancy within the teen zone, you know, mind about sort of what their goals are and what their experiences are in terms of fighting and consequences. And then once you sort of build that discrepancy, um, you sort of build motivation through that to potentially change behavior. And, uh, and then once you've got somebody sort of uh, 
ready to uh, think about why they might want to change the types of behaviors they're involved in, then you can start to talk to them about what are some skills that they can use to change those behaviors. Uh, and so that's where you come in with sort of thinking about uh, anger management and um, and skills for avoiding violence and nonviolent conflict resolution and avoiding substance use that escalates violence and and thinking of and, and we have primarily tried to build those skills through uh, through scenarios that you can walk uh, the teen through uh, potential experiences they've had or similar situations uh, and we've built them sort of around you know common things like uh, peers that are fighting or dating partners or uh, substance use uh, that's used at a party and, and sort of thinking about how all those things might contribute to violent outcomes and, and skills that they could apply in those situations. And it's really about empowering them, them to come up with the solutions and helping to guide them to some of the things that we know work for the problem. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the um, in a nutshell, the, um, the intervention. Um, we know, to your second question, we know that violence, um, just in general, if you were to measure it for out to a year to two years, it sort of decreases over that trajectory to some extent, uh, just among the general population of youth and so that are involved in violence. So we know that that's the reason for using a control group, because what you're looking for is whether or not you're going to see a steeper decline among those yeah. kids who get the intervention than, than the control group. Uh huh. And you do. But you do see a, a strong decline among the control group, which is great. It sounds like that intervention is is really smartly grounded in um, uh, the the first part of it is getting the the, the teen or the you know the subject to understand to come to the conclusion herself or himself that this isn't working for me. This is not congruent with my hopes and dreams. And yeah, then so. you can build on that realization that he or she makes. Exactly. So yeah. the idea is, um, is, uh, is teens, especially adolescents, there's a strong element of, you know, um, you know, being an autonomous person, and that's a very important concept for a teen. And so they having them come to that realization is way more powerful than if right, right. just tell them something, right? So yeah, right. They're not going to listen to us anyway. We know that from our own experience. <laughs> so Rena asks, she says, there's a problem, program in Chicago similar to Safer Teens in addressing conflict resolution and anger management for young adult Black men. Are there data yet to show that these programs reduce firearm violence? Is I mean, do you know about this program? I, I don't know this, this particular program, but uh, I can speak to sort of what I know about the literature at large. And, and that is that um, we don't yet have data on reducing firearm violence specifically. The Safer Teens program reduced peer and partner violence generally. Uh -huh. We are now doing, and I sort of alluded to this in the talk, but didn't go in depth into it, the, the Interact program that I talked about is really focused specifically on firearm behaviors and firearm uh -huh. violence. And so mm -hmm. we're sort of testing a, a model that builds out from Safer Teens and looks at a little bit of a slightly different population to address that question specifically, because it we don't have data on that yet yet okay it's so exciting what you guys are doing i'm just so excited that you're that you have the freedom and the money now to do this research it's very very promising um shelly says you mentioned the government has shifted somewhat in proposing policies given the rise in mass shootings what's in the pipeline with regard to firearm legislation and regulation so um I don't know that there's any, there's certainly nothing that I've heard about at the federal level around legislation and regulation per se. I think what's changed is the ability to look at the efficacy of policies and, and, um, and, um, and regulations that are put into place. And those are largely done in this country with firearm regulations at the state level. And one of the things that sets up is, is sort of a laboratory. You can look at different states and what states have done and similar states that haven't done that. And you can sort of see what the differences are. Uh, and that's, that's where an institute like uh, the University of Michigan Institute comes into play is in looking at when a state puts a policy in place, what's the impact of that policy? And I would say the most active research right now is really around looking at a lot of the states that have recently implemented these ERPO laws or red flag laws. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's new and we don't know yet sort of how it works or what it's doing. And, and so that's sort of what we're trying to figure out. Okay. Well, 
we're out of time. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We've learned a ton and really appreciate um, your spending time with us and also your amazing work. Thank you very, very much. Thanks so much for your interest in this issue. It's, it's nice to see groups that are fo focused in, on this and, as an important issue. We will do what we can. <laughs> Thank you. All and right. thanks everybody else for joining. <laughs> Thank you for joining Bruce and Jews tonight. On Friday, February 25th for Lunch and Learn, host Shelley Shanfield will talk with Jimena Lovelock, who's the health officer of the Washtenaw County Department of Health about the pandemic and public health, or the pandemic, public health and politics. We hope you can join us. To register, go to the calendar at lwvwashtenaw.org, where you can also find more detail about the program, which you can also find on our Facebook page. And now I need to say goodbye. This has been my last turn as host for Brews and Views. I've really enjoyed my time working with other members of the program committee, uh, the chair, Donna Rudder. I mean, Crutter, I saw Rudder in my notes. Donna, Donna Crutter. Um, Rena Bash, who recruited me in the first place, and then Lunch and Learn host Shelly Shanfield. We've had a great time. Um, and we feel like we've brought many excellent programs to Bruise and Views to help us get through the pandemic. We've explored local and national angles on voting rights, criminal legal reform, women's reproductive rights, race in America, threats to the guardrails of democracy, and so much more. And now in this momentous election year, it's time to turn our attention to other activities and other opportunities to inform and support voters exercising their most fundamental rights as Americans. I've greatly enjoyed being with you and spending this time with you every month. And thank you for being here tonight. Take good care. <laughs>